Okay. Well, first of all, good good morning again to everyone. Um, we had a week off last week. I hope everybody um, used your, your your Saturday time wisely last week and enjoyed the holiday and spent some good time with, with family and, and friends. Uh, so we, we're convening again this Saturday. Uh, we do have two presenters that will be coming into the room uh, around noontime. And so prior to them uh, joining us, I just want to do some walk through on, on governance uh, from um, our perspective as an organization. And so we have a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, I want to share. And then there are a couple of videos we're going to share. And, and you may find and probably will find some of this uh, information repetitive, uh, just being um, presented from different perspectives. So Michelle, let's get started with the uh, our first slide of this morning. I, I want to just uh, uh, emphasize that, from my perspective, cooperative governance is is probably the most uh, important aspect of, of of growing and developing a cooperative, and how you build um, uh, involvement uh, from cooperative members, uh, those that are leading and those that are taking uh, specific roles within the cooperative. Um, many times in my experiences when I've seen um, the dismantling of cooperatives, it's, it's, it's really has been tied back to the governance and how governance was built um, around um, having everyone take ownership, the ownership aspect of the organization. So we're going to take a, 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 a short uh, ride down that road today looking at governance. So next slide, Michelle. OK, so we, we're, we're going to ask the question, why governance matters, the role of boards and directors, the, the characteristics of effective board leadership, and what are some of the barriers to effective governance and some of the trends that we've seen in Maryland co-op governance, since we are doing this uh, academy uh, between the District of Columbia and, and, and Maryland. Go ahead, second slide, Michelle. So why does governance matters? Well, we know that, you know, a lot of times we, we, we read about scandals and, and, and organizations um, are not doing things properly. So the governance of the leadership and the leadership of the organization um, helps guide an uh, organization along the path of, of not hopefully making some critical mistakes along the road. But as I said earlier, you know, governance is really is the bedrock of, of, of how an organization functions and, and, and operates. And so we've seen some of that happen here over the years with with Enron, uh, the oil um, company down in Houston, Lehman Brothers, um, which is an investment group, and how governance can can certainly lack of governance can certainly lead to the failure of your organizations. Next slide. So why governance matters? Well, effective governance equals effective performance. So if you have a good operating body that's governing the organization in the way the governance is building intentionality around leadership, principles and practices, more than likely, that's going to equate to your performance. And your performance means being able to achieve your, your mission goals, other outcomes that you have selected for yourself going forward. So again, the effectiveness of your governance and how you are bringing people on board, um, what kind of education they're getting is really critical to the performance of your cooperatives. Next slide, Michelle. So why government matters? Because you, you uh, as cooperatives, and most of you who are moving down this road or starting cooperatives, 
you have accountability. You have accountability, first of all, to your membership. Those folks who you're bringing in as members of your cooperative, you have accountability to them. And aside from that, you have accountability to following the cooperative principles. Now, earlier in our earlier sessions, we talked about the seven cooperative principles, but also we talked about the seven principles of Nugosaba and how it, how those seven principles also engage in, 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 in building the cooperative. Because at the end of the day, you own it. And how you, how you build it is how it will function. That bedrock I mentioned earlier about the foundation is so critical. Next slide, Michelle. So the role of the boards, and there are four key areas that with, with, when you talk about board and board of directors, leadership, stewardship, monitoring, and reporting. Now, what is leadership? Well, leadership is being able to, to be intentional about owning and sharing. You know, there's a saying that good leadership builds leadership. Stewardship, taking ownership of decision-making and the process itself so that you can be able to monitor what your outcomes are. Are you meeting your benchmarks? And of course, reporting, being able to, to gather data, information, and report that back into to your, your membership. Next slide. So the role of the board of directors, well, you, you, you manage and you supervise the management of the business. The operations go to a different individual. But when you look at your fiduciary responsibility, that is the role of the board to make sure that you are following due diligence and prudence in the daily operating, the daily uh, oversight of the of the operations. So that means that you have a, a strong relationship with your managers or your frontline workers in terms of what they're doing, um, that you building intentionality around the organization with 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 maybe pops the funders or other policy makers um and that you're making sure that you know all that is 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 wrapped up in good sound management practices makes a slide okay again the role of of the board is to Again, looking at um, how do you frame out and lead and grow, um, and it can be very, very challenging. Um, you know, I think one of the things I've I've learned over the years of my working with organizations, bringing people together who have different perspectives, it takes really good leadership to 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 galvanize um, leaders, and some of it um, is a trial. And most of it probably sometimes is trial and area error in terms of understanding the dynamics that come with working with a board of, of directors and when everyone probably may have some different perspectives of their experiences. Uh, next slide. So board asks a different question than the management. And so when you Look at the hierarchy of boards and the operations of the of the co-op. The board asks asks the question: So, what are we trying to achieve? For whom are we trying to achieve it, and what cost is it going to cost us? That is the fiduciary role of the board to ask those questions. Now, management. For those of you who who are working and developing cooperatives really differently. You have management folks who are in place doing your operations, making sure that your products and services are, are being delivered. You're asking the question, how will we achieve it? Through, through marketing, through building other in relationships. So there are two separate questions between the, what the board is looking to do in terms of what it's looking at versus 
what the management and those who are in the, in the daily operations of the co-op are asking themselves. Next question, uh, next, excuse me, next slide, Michelle. So the board owns the vision, mission and values. Each of you, as you're developing your cooperative, at this point should have a mission statement that's guiding the, the mission of, of why you're doing what you're doing. The vision statement is gonna be a much broader lookout in terms of how you foresee this work or this effort that you are uh, developing benefiting others individually or collectively. How you see the organization growing. And then of course the values are, are, the, are the basic principles that bind all of this together in terms of how you want to, to show up. What values are you as a cooperative wanting to extend to your membership? What values of the cooperative do you want to share in the communities that you're working with? And of course, um, if you look back from the board back again to the management, the, the, the manager is, owns, owns that strategic plan that the board develops. And some of you, um, I will say, may have developed a strategic plan and some of you may have been working on business plans. And so those who are responsible for the daily operations are the ones who are facilitating those, 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 plan, those plans going forward and how they are going to be impactful in the communities that you're working with. Oh, pardon me. Next slide, Michelle. So at this point, I, I, I want to just, again, um, separate, it, separate out the role of the board and the role of the management in the governance of a cooperative or a business period because they're diff different roles um, for each place but they're all interconnected they're all interconnected so when i talked about the vision mission and values the vision is where do we want to be in the future many of you uh, have already gone down that road now looking at your your future five years ten years and where do you want to be at what kind of organization do you want to be and the mission statement is going to drive you to ask the question, why do we exist? Who are we trying to serve? Are we trying to serve ourselves or are we trying to serve the community? And I contend that cooperatives have a larger perspective and should have a larger perspective of serving the community. And the community could be as, as you have defined it. And I think there's always a new definition of, of coming, looking at communities. And of course, the last thing I, I, I want to um, uh, uh, embed it in that mission vision is the values. Those essential beliefs of, of collective effort, of rewarding the work that you're doing, how you onboard people into your cooperative. And your values are going to decide and guide your decisions as well as your actions. Too often, and we see that businesses stray away from values and focus on, on the objective of wanting to just uh, maybe just make money or maybe just uh, have a, a, a small presence with no values. And we're seeing it show up, you know, in everyday life, you know, that we're they're experiencing as, as, as individuals um, in this country. Values now is, is, is a big paramount of the discussions that we're having. Where are our values as a country now? What would our vision be going forward? particularly 
when you're hearing the politicals talk about democracy and possibly being at risk. So your vision, your mission, and your values are the pillars to which you're building your cooperatives on. And I would think I would say that any one of these pillars, when it in default, could crumble your cooperatives or your business or your social enterprise. Any of these three pillars that are in shambles, if you don't have good values, if you don't have a mission to why you're existing and a vision how to you want to see that mission grow in the future. These are three pivotal um, areas that you need to be thinking about all the time as you think through growing your cooperative uh, as, as, as sustainable entities in, 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 in your communities. Next slide, Michelle. So I mentioned um, strategic planning because um, most nonprofits do a strategic plan. Most most for-profit businesses do a business plan, and in some cases, both them can can have uh, intertwining objectives. So, let's go down this road and talk about the board's role in strategic planning. Um, certainly, you want to be able to review and approve it. You want to to embed some understanding of what your challenges are. Some of, of, of those of us who, who, who work in a space of strategic plan, we call the strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so you wanna be able to understand what your, your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, what's gonna drive your critical success factors? And, and those factors could be about how you engage community, um, whether what you're doing is, is relevant to, to uh, the community that you're looking to serve. So understanding all those, those, those dynamics in terms of what the success factors are. So I know that many of you, as I've come to uh, get to know you, I know many of you are having or had or either had these conversations internally already. Due diligence, well, you know, I, I, I simply think due diligence is, is, is what you do as you, what you do and needing to show up. And the accountability that follows that. And this word accountability, we're hearing so much around it as we look at what's happening in, in, in communities today. Particularly when it, you look at law enforcement. You know your strategic plan. You 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 wanted to 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 as with a business plan. What is it achievable and is it realistic? In in two years, can we be a, a, a billion dollar corporation in two years, or should we look at at the building the platform of 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 looking at realistic goals? And so I think sometimes you know. Uh, that, as I've talked to folks in who are always looking to to, to um, start nonprofits, I think one of the misnomers is that they, they think that because I started nonprofit, uh, automatically I'm going to start receiving grant monies. And I tell people, people, groups all the time, know that because you've incorporated as a nonprofit doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the grant support that you need to support your your organizational mission. It may be it may come over a longer period of time than you may have originally um, um, imagined. So you want to have a, a plan going forward that's realistic, folks, and that's achievable based on your capacity, based on the resources that you're able to to uh, assemble. And those resources come in, in many, many different ways. Lastly, your plan should also be a measurement 
of your success. Whether it's a two-year plan or a five-year plan, you should be able to measure whether, whether or not you're meeting some goals that you have outlined. And, and as you measure your success, that reporting comes back to it translate into the reporting back internally as well as externally. If you're a nonprofit, certainly your funders are gonna always be asking about reporting and, and whether or not you've been able to achieve the things that you have said to them that you would achieve as a result of securing the funding that they've given you to, um, to do or engage in, in the project work that you're doing. So monitoring performance is, is, is critical going forward because you're able now to take that reporting and look at it as another building block to engage others in your work when they're seeing the success that you're doing. They're seeing the number of people that you're serving. They're seeing the impact of the work that you're doing in terms of uh, growing um, the work economically or socially. In, in 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 aspects so monitoring is really imp important because you want to be able to gauge and, and and have some 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 plateaus that you're trying to 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 build and i again i i i'm sharing some new information with some of you and some of you have already begun to ask yourself these questions over the course of time already because you've been they say in the game for a while so you know what the expectations are so when you go to talk with a, a foundation or or a funder they're going to ask you the question do you have a plan whether it's a strategic plan or whether it's a business plan do you know where you're going do you know how you're going to get there is there a way of measuring your outcomes are you collecting data in terms of your successes and and your, your successes and your shortfalls? And how do you readjust when, you, when you're not meet, meeting all your prescribed uh, uh, objectives that you've outlined in your plan? How do you readjust and, and reposition yourself? And that's where we are right now in this world of COVID. We're all re, redesigning the work that we're doing. We are reimagining our work differently now based on a pandemic that has been with us for over a year and probably and will probably have some impact in years to come. Because as you will see that we're not bringing this economy back full flesh, it's coming back in, in different spaces more rapidly than other spaces. And that's, that's, the, that's why a plan becomes really critical to moving forward and doing the work that we're doing. Because you wanna be able to plan for success, folks. And those that plan for success have a plan that guides that movement of that success. Next slide, Michelle. Key success factors for effective board directors, understanding leadership. When you are part of a collective business, no one individual, no two individuals should be guiding the work of the organization is shared leadership cooperative is work is shared leadership and so being able to to move from what is my perspective to understanding what is our perspective of course you know we know in cooperative it's one person one vote and i was just talking to someone recently about a housing cooperative where a few members of the board have been orchestrating the work of the co-op and what has happened now is created division within that cooperative because a few individuals not understanding the role of leadership and an effective the effectiveness of legitimate power are uh, moving to now to exercise their authority over the entire group so you it's important to understand your function and your role and your responsibilities, folks. And so, as I said earlier at the beginning, you know, this is work of governance. It's the bedrock of having a successful 
organization, having a successful business. The last thing about the big thing about the board is, is understanding competence. Because you have to set a high bar. And particularly for those of you who are now starting this cooperative, because you are now the foundational board members, you got to set a high bar of competence because you're going to be recruiting other members to come into your cooperative. So if you have a low bar of expectation, folks, believe me, you'll get that in terms of the people that you seek to, to join and become a part of your cooperative. I'm just going to lay it out there to you, folks. It's the law of attraction. When you start talking about being great, then you have to show up being great in this space because others will be looking and mirroring you. So, so making sure that you have a consistency about what you're doing and how you're doing this work is really critical. You know, again, going back to the seven principles of, uh, of international seven principles of cooperatives, the principles of Nugosaba that we talked about are really important in terms of building competency within your organization. And of course, you know, the culture. You know, I remember back in the in the 80s, you know, IBM had a culture of a blue suit and a red tie. That was their culture. That so you were an IBM employee that you wear a blue suit and a red tie. Well, along came Apple to said that say, hey, listen, we, we're gonna disband that kind of uh platform for our culture, and we're just gonna let you show up casual. You don't have to wear a suit into the office. And so that we make it a lot more um, functional in, by having a lot less structure in some areas. And so the culture that you start to inbred in your in your cooperatives is going to be again a reflection of 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 of, of the leadership um, wholeheartedly. So if you're going to be having folks um, show up, then you're going to have to show up as an example and build the culture that you want to see this your cooperatives have as you continue on. And everyone's culture is different um, depending on what they bring to the table and how they grow themselves. But at the, at the very least, you want your culture, cultural aspect to be very functional to your organization effort. Efficient management, structure and process i can't talk about that enough because if you are a manager and you're co and you're a board member and you don't have skill sets to 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 lead and understanding growth then you're probably going to not be able to share that in in a, in a in a great way with those folks who are coming into your organization so you so you this is a these are ongoing processes folks and um and again you know i'm i'm speaking to a lot of you who, who are already in this space you understand it wholeheartedly you're doing it and you've had your experiences around it your successes and your failures and hopefully your failures have helped to build a a, a culture of success because you're taking those failures and you've learned from them you're not just rested on them as, as, as inadequacies, you've taken them and you've grown from them. And that's the good mark of a good leader, in my mind. When you're able to take things that you've not been good at and you've grown them to the point that you are good at them. Um, I, I want to just take an offer just to, to put my, my, my little personal sports analogy into it. Uh, watching the, the the ball game last night with the Clippers and and the Mavericks, and uh, and one of the commentators made a comment about Kawhi Leonard, one of the um, premier players on the Los Angeles Clippers, and he said, you know, two years ago this player didn't have the footwork, nor did he have the kind of game that he now has today, but he also noted that he's worked on it each summer. While he was not being in the competitive ring, he was going back 
every summer working on a different aspect of, of his game. Whether it was a jump shot, whether it was a dribbling, whether it was um, um, his rebounding, he worked on certain aspects of his, of his game to make him a better player. And I use that analogy to say, even as businesses, we have to take that kind of attitude as well. You don't stop growing as a business person because you think you arrived. You have to keep building your content, which means I, I gotta keep reading. I gotta keep connecting to conferences and symposiums and other ways of getting more educational um, uh, knowledge. I gotta do more networking. And I can't say enough folks, how networking and the importance of networking is it is because no one is expected to know everything. Building good networks allow you to get access areas that you may not be strong in or that you may need to be more knowledgeable in. And so again, you know, building a, 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 a cooperative, building a business, it's an organic process, folks. Never think that you've arrived because there always will be something new along this journey that you'll be, be challenged to learn. And through this whole cooperative academy thus far, you've heard from many, many professionals in many areas of walks. But that's just a teaser around the work that needs to go forth. Now, I said this at the early session, almost uh, now, almost 12 weeks ago, that we introduce you to a lot of different principles around cooperatives. But the onus is on you to really go ahead and take what we've shared with you thus far and, and continue to, to grow it. And so that's where effective leadership is, is important. Um, building your content, you know, experimenting, um, being innovative, um, and don't be afraid of, of what you may call failure. Because without the, the learned lessons of, of, quote, failure, we will never get to the lessons of learning what success is. So never be too afraid to step out and take risks in terms of your organizations and the work that you're doing. Because there should be some learned lessons that comes back of that if you're properly analyzing and internalizing what you're doing. Next slide, Michelle. All right. So this is a, a dictatorship competency map. Um, I'm not going to go through every aspect of it. But again, everything evolves out of leadership, folks. Everything that you're going to be doing is going to be evolving out of leadership your judgment and decision-making, how you influence and negotiate, how you deal with people. All this is gonna evolve out of this um, compass C map that, that I've laid out here. So we'll, at some point, um, I'm hoping maybe we will be spend more time dwelling because this is a discussion in a session in itself. So I'm hoping that as you bringing folks into your organization, that you're having these internal discussions about what it's going to take to get you there, who are we trying to influence, what kind of skill sets are we trying to to develop ourselves. Um, these are big, large questions that um, the corporate businesses are now asking and have always asked themselves. Next slide, Michelle. So what are some of the barriers to effective governance? Well, I've, I've been talking about leadership and nothing's worse than having an ineffective leader. Um, I think um, we've seen some of that over the last four years in our own country in terms of what ineffective leadership can do. Um, having a represent, representational mindset as I said earlier, you have to, at the basis, understand that one 
person, one vote drives cooperative work. If you're going to invest it in you being a power broker, making all the power decisions, then that is not the, the, the framework to which a cooperative operates. So you're going to have to work at dismissing that thought at the onset. Even though you may be the founder of the, of the organization, you're going to have to look at shared leadership and create a mindset around that. I talked about uh, earlier about the mission, the vision, and, and, and the values. And, and so one of the levels of barriers is just having a, a, a lacking uh, commitment to sustain the vision and mission and values. You might have heard this during this, this thought before about mission creep. And it's real. You may have a mission to, statement today that's embodied all of what you are envisioning um, and wanting to do. And maybe over time, you creeped away from it. Maybe you're working, has said, I work in underserved communities. And then all of a sudden, you know, five years later, you see yourself working in communities that aren't representative of, um, uh, of, of people who've been shut out. And so it's, it's important to, to, to really hold and always revisit your vision statement, your mission statement, and your values. Those become the, the really uh, uh, um, uh, interceptors for being able to sustain those things. Um, having an unclear def definition of your function roles and responsibility, I hope that all of you are, as you developing your cooperatives, you're writing down descriptions for workers, descriptions for your board members, what their roles and responsibilities are. So when you're bringing people on board, you can clearly articulate to, to them, this is this is what you, you're expected to do. This is your role. This are your responsibilities. And don't leave the, the chance to, to verbalize it, folks, please. The worst thing you do is leave it the chance to verbalize it. Um, because you want to form agreement. Mm -hmm. Early on, when all of you came into this space of uh, 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 registering for this academy, you all signed a memorandum of, of agreement. It was not a memorandum of the same, it was a memorandum of agreement that this is, this is what we as an organization, you as the, the participant in this academy would agree to. We had certain guidelines about attendance showing up. We said, "Hey, listen. You know, this is a this is a no cost academy. Only thing that we want to ask of you is that you show up intentionally every Saturday to to participate and help grow this work, because the work that we're growing here goes long beyond the work that we're growing for all of you. And I just want you to know, understand that's our vision. Yes, we're doing." this academy, but each time we do these academies, we're hoping to take some learning lessons from it that we can take into the next experience. Um, uh, uh, this lack of clarity between roles and management of uh, uh, um, the management and the, the board, um, sometimes, you know, it gets cloudy because the board may trespass in the areas that are around operation and management. And that opens so many doors when you don't have the knowledge um, and experience and you brought folks on who are who are paid to do a certain job. Yes, you you manage them through information, you manage them through conversation, you manage them through the communication. But understanding what what the what the different roles are as a board member and as, as a part of a management team. Most importantly, they have to be able to work together for the collective good of the cooperative. And some of these experiences, some of you may be experiencing already, I don't know. You know, you may be asking yourself the question, why we aren't able to, to grow our cooperatives and getting more, more funding or more people engaged. And so hopefully um, this session today in governance will have you re-examine 
and reimagine the work that you're doing in terms of building governance internally as well as externally around your cooperatives. Um, I can't um, talk enough about trust. Um, trust is the basis for me of every relationship that I engage in. If I don't have a trust in an individual, then I don't have the, have the foundation of a good sound relationship. And trust is something that does not happen at, at the onset of a flick of a switch. It's built over time through experiences. For those of you, when you think about your personal relationships, there have been times of trial and, tri and tribulations when you help others and others may have helped you and you might have been challenged by it. But in a in the long run, you're building trust. I rather know who you are than who you're not. And the only way I get to know who you are is by having this experience with you. I've had a chance to sit down and talk with all of you one-on-one -on -one and get a sense of what you're envisioning, what you like to do. And I think all of you are, are committed to just being, being that and showing up in this space. It's going to be it's going to be your hard mark and after this academy is over, how you start to build that trust with others to help grow your your cooperatives and grow your businesses. Because people are going to again look at you, they're going to be relying on you, and and they're going to trust you to be the leader that you need to be in this space. Next slide, Michelle. Again. You know, other barriers are imbalance of skills and competencies. You know, you know what you know, folks. I know what I know. And what I don't know, I go to others to 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 either provide those services or teach me. Um so um that's important. Um building your skill sets. Uh poor informational management, um, too much, too little. Um again, information is the key. Burnout of board members. Um, all too often, I had this conversation with folks about burnout. You can't take a collective effort and turn it into some individualism that's only you, all about you. Because sooner or later, you are going to hit. You're going to hit a threshold of burnout. And so you want to be able to share this work among board members and as well as uh, other members of cooperatives so that no one is tackling more than they can actually have the capacity to do. That's where burnout happens, where you don't have the capacity. You're working around the clock. I'm going to build this, I'm going to build this. And, and then when you look around, you're the only person who are working to, to do that. So that's really, really important, folks, to, to not deal with the burnout and recognizing when you're on a path of burning yourself out that's self-realization to me and i think many folks sometimes may not understand when they're on that path to burning themselves out and then all of a sudden the frustration you know starts to to turn in and that leads to this next point about turnover because when you start dealing with burnout people start to, to drop out on you because they've been overwhelmed. They've been overwhelmed. And sometimes when people are overwhelmed, may feel uncomfortable by telling you they're overwhelmed. And so you got to do a check-in. You know, during this pandemic, we've been asking ourselves and we asked others, we were just checking in on people's mental health, where they've been at, how are they doing. And so we have to, you know, again, have this a part of your intentional effort around what you're doing regarding your 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 relationship with all your board members the very issue with your your cooperative members that you check in on 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 where they are in 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 certain spaces and again i'm not sharing anything that all of you have not experienced at, at, at some point in time and have your own experiences around so when you think people have just walked away maybe it's not just walking away maybe they were just burnt out and so that's that's really important. 
And, and, and lastly, one of the other barriers to effective government is lack of succession planning. None of us are here forever. And while you may be the, the orchestrator planting the seeds now, you have to actually be able to plant the seeds for the future. So you gotta have a plan. You either plan for failure or you plan for success. So you gotta have a plan in terms of how you're gonna grow beyond yourselves. Life has challenges. We all are, are just living human beings engaged in a lot of things. And yes, today we have a passion for it. That doesn't necessarily mean two years from now that I'm 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 driven by the same passion. So how do I ensure that the organization is going to continue to grow? And that's again having a successful plan for growth and being able to 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 know that when I step out of the space, there's a plan with how others are engaged in the space. Next slide, Michelle. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Let's talk about some trends and and th that happens in governance. Well, we want to have um, improved accountability. So we always want to be able to sit back and look at your at your existing documents because the, the bylaws that you de develop today may not be the bylaws that we will be needing a year from now, maybe two years from now. And so they've gotten you to a certain point. But to get to the next level means, means that we may have to go back and, and, and revisit our bylaws. So for all of you who are writing bylaws right now, don't think that those bylaws are gonna carry you from here to eternity, because they won't. They'll take you to a certain point in time, and then you're gonna have to revisit them to see if they're applicable to the space that you're in. Um, evaluation, be able to sit down as a board and evaluate all aspects of, of your yourselves as an as a, as a operating board to see what your shortfalls are, what things that you've been able to, 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 to be good at. Because those are, those are measurements. And so if you don't take time to sit down and, and, and measure yourself, how will you ever know what you're doing is, is being effective? Just ask yourself that question. How will you ever know that you're being effective if you, if you can't evaluate and um, your effectiveness or your lack of? That's, that's the looking at the mirror. That's when you got the mirror in front of you and you're looking at yourself and you're looking at yourself organizationally where we are, where do we need to go? How do we evaluate our successes and the failures and, and our growth? And that also is connected to being able to, again, being able to get the feedback from folks in your, in, in your cooperatives. For those of you who are doing communities, how often are you surveying your community members to get their, their, their input? Are you holding focus groups, listening groups, Listening circles, where you're getting folks to, 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 to give you some input, or are you just driving what you think is right for everyone else? Think on that. Because I see that as as, as 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 one of those things that leads to failure. When when we don't engage those that we're providing services for in the discussions of what services are needed. No one can tell you what you need, but you. And communities are the same, in the same vein, and so are be members of your cooperatives. You're gonna have to be able to do a, a check-in and a checkup on where folks are. And so sometimes you gotta take the time out and just be able to hear and listen to those conversations and to what those needs are you'll find them to be very, very valuable along the way. And not only just learning more about who you're, who you're connected to, but how to sustain your connectivity. Next slide, um, Michelle. So 
these are some statistics in terms of just the average size of most boards, usually about 10. Um, I know organizations that have 26 member boards and believe me, um, they have a lot of people on the board and certain people, politicians and other business people, but the core group of the board um, is a small group that really drives the organization. So it's not how big you are as a board, it's how effective you are. Um, we just went through a process of, of recruiting for our board. And one of the things that was missing was, was the presence of more women. And so I, I want to have a concerted effort to recruit more women to our board. Um, so it can be representative in terms of what we talked about in terms of diversity around the table. Mm -hmm. Meetings. Um, meetings are important only if they're effective. Don't meet just to meet, folks. So be mindful of how you schedule meetings, how many meetings you schedule throughout the year, because remember, the people that you're um, uh, asking for their time are people who are already busy. They have full-time jobs, full-time family obligations. So you want to be mindful of that as you schedule your meetings throughout your calendar year. All right, and so these are two, two numbers around the average length of services, non-financial co-ops, seven and a half years, and credit unions about nine years. Well, I would say right now that this number for average non-financial co-ops, seven and a half years, no, nah, I would say folks look at two to three years as the most that you're gonna get out of any board member serving on your board, two to three years. And if you're lucky to get someone, a fortune to get someone beyond three years, you've got a, uh, a real commitment. But normally, two to three years. And again, I go back to that bullet point about burnout. Because you want to be able to rotate fresh ideas inside your co-op. And so when you have folks that are there for long tenures of time, you got to ask yourself the question, is the ideas changing? Is the vision changing? Have their ideas changed? Sometimes you'll find, in, in most cases, you'll find that folks get stagnant in the water. They're just showing up, not bringing new, vibrant ideas to the table. So, so be mindful of how long you want to have your folks serve on your board. Um, and as I said, this is like, like bullet point number last one, most directors have three-year terms. That's why I say two to three years. And then I want to rotate you off the board. I can rotate you to a committee, but I may, may not want to keep you on the board more than three years because I want to infuse, just like a transfusion, new ideas. And so that's why organizationally, um, this organization has made a commitment to bring more, more women on board. And not only more women on board, but we brought more younger board members on board. Previously, all our board members are over 50. And that was not a good recipe for success. Believe me, I'm telling you what I experienced because the stagnation was certainly embedded in it. And so I wanted to make sure that we were in tune with the times. And the only way to be in tune with the times was to bring people in to this organization who had different ideas about how to do things. And we've been fortunate to, to, to be a benefactor of bringing new ideas on board. Next uh, um, slide, Michelle. Okay, well, okay. And so these are some trends that you need to look at growth, profitability, financial sustainability, uh, member relations, uh, mergers. And so you'll get this, and it's a little blurry now, but you'll get this PowerPoint. And so you'll be able to share it with your, your, your boards as well as your members. Uh, but those are some of the trends you got to be able to look at. You got to be able to have matrix of measurement. And so you being the new innovative co-op member, board director, you got to bring newness into the space. You're being challenged now with skill sets that 30 years ago, many cooperative developers or cooperative owners did not weren't required to learn. But now we know we're in a changing environment economically and we need new, new newness around new knowledge and skill sets. 
that again that's going to propel us forward and not hinder us. Next slide, Michelle. Okay, keep going. All right. Well, I've done a lot of talking. Um, and so um, I hope you found this uh, presentation useful. Uh, we'll send it out to you. Um, and so we'll take some time. Our speakers are coming in at 12 o'clock. We, we do have a few videos we want to sh share with you as well. But for the time being, I want to open the mic up for any comments or observations or any inputs that some of you may have regarding what we've shared or what you have learned as a part of your experience. Um, Mr. Haynes, this is uh, Tiffany Page. I, I first want to say thank you again for this information. I took uh, great notes. And I also, um, I'm not sure if now is a good time, but I wanted to extend an invitation to all of our classmates. I know June 19th is our last day. And I know that we are kind of spread out over various states. But uh, here in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, there's a restaurant known as the Terra Cafe. It's on 101 East 25th Street. And I'll also uh, send out a uh, flyer invitation as well. But I wanted to host a um, kind of last day Juneteenth luncheon for the group. If uh, it was okay with you, Mr. Hanson, I would also send out the flyer Thank as you. well. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, Miss Miss Page, you didn't tell the story that how we how we sort of bumped into each other a couple weeks ago. <laughs> we did, we did. It was stumbled into Mr. Haynes. Say, look, I, I know you from anywhere now, Mr. Haynes. I, I saw, I said, that looks like Mr. Haynes. <laughs> and so we did. We saw each other there at the Terra Cafe, and wonderful to know that you two are already collaborating and doing work as well. And I kind of worked with um Mr. Dixon on some of his uh, community and social enterprise and goals. So I'm I'm very glad to see that this work is already in the making. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Page. You know, collaboration is the key, folks. I, 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 I can't echo out that en enough. If you're working in a silo by yourself, um, you're working towards failure. I just going to just lay that out to you. And that's, that's not, that's just my perspective. If you're working in a silo by yourself, you're working at failure. You have to be able to, to align yourself with others who have, a, who have a similar vision and a similar mission. And it doesn't have to be in totality. And I think that sometimes we, we make that um, misnomer that everything has to be everything. No, no, it doesn't have to be everything. We can, we can collaborate around agreement the things that we agreed to, to work together on. You know, we all are parents, are children of parents. And, and I'm quite sure like me, like most of you, I wasn't always in agreement with my parents, but I understood that when there was agreement, oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that aspect. When, it, when my mother and my father and I agreed, oh, it eased the tension, believe me, <laughs> 1000 degrees. But when we're at discord, we were at discord. So, so folks, that you you know again, start to look at building, um, or even reframing the work that you're doing around this cooperative. You know, take all these things in, in, into question because it really, the work doesn't stop, and that's what I'm telling you. Hear me clearly: the work do not stop. You have to continue to build, rebuild, reimagine what you're doing. You got to do that survey between you and, and your members. You got to do that evaluation between you and your board. You got to go back and look at your business plans on a regular basis to see if they're current, if the if the thinking is still in place. You know, this is an organic process, folks. Growing businesses is organic because there's always new information coming into, into the to the space. And you heard that from so many of the speakers that we've had a chance to, to have as a part of this academy. So if you think that you got there 
and you're resting comfortably being there, then I will tell you, you're setting yourself up for failure. Never think you arrived. Continue to strive. Continue to strive for it. Um, any again, before we go into showing the video, any any comments or input anyone wants to share? Well, the information that um, that I've been getting throughout the sessions uh, has just been extraordinary. <laughs> And uh, I do appreciate being able to have the the opportunity to uh, participate in this conference or this, these teachings, rather. And um, we've got so much to work on. It's like, where do we start? But we're, we're going to start and continue and persevere until we get it right and, and get it to uh, the part of fruition. So I um, thank you again. So thank you as well. You know, I, I like that Nike slogan, just do it. Mm -hmm. I love that. It just, it's a, it's a very affirming statement. Just do it. Mm -hmm. and, if you, and if you start the journey, believe me, I'm a believer in, in this here, the law of attraction. What you need will be attracted to you once you start the journey. What you need will be attracted to you. And you got to take owner, owner, ownership of the fact that this universe is a vast universe of resources. There's no limiting limitation on resources in the in the in, in the universe. And so you you may ask yourself in your own personal experiences that you 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 you're seeing things show up and you might have asked yourself, wow, I, I didn't I didn't know that, I didn't expect that. Because the universe is always responsive to our needs. All you, all we're asked to do is believe. Have a heightened level of, of belief around what we're doing. And so we sur surround ourselves with knowledge. We surround ourselves with the people who, who bring intentionality into the space. And you're getting a lot of that through this academy in terms of all the presenters who given their time um, every Saturday to come in and share some of their knowledge with us. Um, so I. So that's my vision, that through these convenings on Saturdays that we can come and 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 we be renourished in in intellect, be renourished spiritually, consciously, so that so that we don't so that we don't look like this little cartoon here, <laughs> you know, still pondering the questions that we've gotten to some solutions. So um, it's about uh, 1130. We've been in the space since about 10, 15. I'm going to um, say, Michelle, let's give a 15 minute break because I've talked enough. And then we're going to come back and see these two short videos. And then we'll have our presenters come in at 12 noon. All right. So let's come back at um, 1135. All right. So take a take a break for biological break or food break. How we choose to spend the time. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so this is the first video. Let me know if you can hear it. While a lot of businesses claim the customer is the boss, at cooperatives, it's literally true. A cooperative is a business that's owned by those who use it and controlled, so the decisions are made by those who use it, and it's primarily meant to benefit those who use it. So the members who are coming in to sell grain or to buy inputs have a voting stake in the company, and benefit from it by sharing the profits. Anyone can become a voting member of a co-op as long as he or she has production at risk. Mm -hmm. 
Most co-ops are open membership in the state of Iowa, so the grain and farm supply cooperatives will allow anyone to be a member as long as they have production at risk. And what that essentially means is if you are a producer who's raising livestock and you buy feed from a co-op or you're producing grain and you purchase inputs or sell grain, as long as you have production at risk, you can be a member of the cooperative. Producers are free to end their membership in a co-op at any time, and the co-op has the right to decide who can and who cannot be members. It's not a requirement to use the co-op if you are a member. Cooperatives have the right to decide who is going to be a member. They, the laws say they can't discriminate on the protected classes like age and race and religious preferences. But if someone is not doing business with a co-op for a number of years, the co-op can decide, we don't want you to be a member anymore. And the reason that's important is if someone is not using the cooperative, there's a question about whether you would want them to have a say in the vote, to be able to vote for a board of directors and vote on big issues like mergers or acquisitions or demutualizations. So you don't have to use the co-op if you're a member. We do have producers who are members of several co-ops, and that's also not uncommon. You can have a member who's a very good member and buys inputs from one co-op, sells grain to another, that's also common. The members have ultimate control through the co-op through their membership share. When they become a member of a cooperative, I'm speaking specifically with grain and farm supply, agricultural cooperatives, they become a member, they have that voting share. That voting share allows them to elect the board of directors. So ultimate control of the cooperative lies in the hands of the voting members. They give that control to the board of directors by voting on a board of directors. So that board of directors is really the voice or the membership. The board of directors then hires a general manager, hires a CEO. So that CEO works for the board members who work for the membership. Voting members are the foundation of every co-op. Cooperatives are the most democratic form of corporation thanks to the concept known as one member, one vote. One number, one vote means that members of an agricultural cooperative have an equal say. And that's important to prevent situations where you have control in the hands of very few. And when you have control in the hands of very few, what that essentially means is they begin operating the business for themselves rather for the entire membership. So a co-op is intended to benefit all members. And one way they achieve that is by allowing all members to have equal say. While members govern the co-op with their votes, their responsibilities go well beyond the ballot box. Members ultimately own the co-op, so their responsibility is to be informed about it. Their responsibility is to vote and make sure that the board of directors is representative of the membership. Their responsibility is to use it because without using the co-op, there's no way for that co-op to be financially sustainable if members are not using the co-op and they have a responsibility to capitalize it in the sense that they are using the co-op, it's profitable and those profits are retained at the co-op for a certain period of time. So because ultimate control of the co-op lies with the membership, ultimate responsibility for the success of that co-op very much lies with the membership and their use of it. Elections to the board of directors usually take place annually. Every voting member is eligible to serve on the board which has its own set of responsibilities. The responsibility a board member has is to represent the membership and oversee the business. When we talk about board member responsibilities, we're primarily talking strategic responsibilities. So maintain a vision for the cooperative, ensure that that vision is carried out and implemented by the CEO. The board members' responsibilities are those of, in a fiduciary nature. So they are overseeing the financial interests of the members. They're making sure that the co-op is operating in a legal way. Those very big picture type responsibilities. When we talk about the roles and responsibilities of someone who uses the cooperative and agricultural producer, we tend to use four terms pretty interchangeably. A customer means I'm transacting and buying and selling through the co-op. A patron means I'm getting the pastures back through my use of the co-op in a year. 
I get allocated a part of the profits or part of the savings. The owner part means that I have an equity stake. My transaction is to provide equity, provide that capital to the co-op. And sometimes I do that passively and sometimes it's actively through my membership share. The membership, the member role is the voting role. It's the responsibility to elect the board of directors to be involved in the co-op. So in summary, most customers that employees are going to interact with at the co-op are all four of those. Customers, patrons, owners, and members. This is the second video. Cooperative governance. What is it? It is the act of directing cooperatively owned enterprises towards economic, social, and cultural success. It consists of answering key questions, defining roles and responsibilities, and establishing processes for setting expectations. To understand and the cooperative's place in the American economic sector, we first must understand the co-op's unique societies. Governance has different levels within a society like national, county, community, family, and group levels, among others. Why cooperative governance? Governance is at the heart of any successful business. It is essential for a cooperative society to achieve its objectives and drive improvements. Cooperative governance helps in maintaining legal and ethical stand in the eye of the shareholders, regulators, and the wider community. What are the aspects of good governance? Please continue to the next topic. Okay. All right. Well, those are two short videos, um, and we'll and we'll make those two available to you as well. Um, again, all this information that we're sharing with you, we hope th the goal is that you're sharing it with with others in your in your network. Um, it, 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 it serves us and serves you and us all not to our greatest good if we're just keeping information among ourselves. So so as you continue to do to um, build your your network and, and educate your members coming in, we'll hope for some of this information that and that we've shared with you through PowerPoints and other recordings that you're sharing with your your membership as well. Um, Michelle, do you want to go ahead and introduce um, Shelly and, 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 and David? Yeah. Um, so, hey everyone, this is our two speakers, Ms. Shelly Miller and um, Mr. David Hammer. So, you may have seen in the email I sent out that I had a brief bio on both of them, but I wanted to expand more on Shelly's bio first that I didn't mention in the email. Um, so Shelly brings more than 25 years of diverse experience in business, law, nonprofit administration, and education to ICA. As a former small business owner and the daughter of a small business owner, Shelly looks forward to sharing her personal experiences with other businesses as they engage with cooperative ownership models. Prior to joining ICA, Shelly spent four years as a business developer, teacher, and coach working with immigrant small business owners at the New American Chamber of Commerce in Brooklyn, New York. Prior positions also include serving as the Director of Adult Education at St. Nick's Alliance, a com community development agency, and as the Director of Youth Development at the Jackie Robinson Center for Physical Culture, a youth development organization, as well as working as an attorney in New York City, in New York City government and in private practice. And as for David Hammer, um, he is a leading practitioner of employee buyouts of small businesses and the Executive Director of the ICA Group, the oldest national organization dedicated to supporting democratic employee ownership. He has assisted in the conversion, launch, and growth of dozens of employee-owned firms and social enterprises. David is an expert on the nuts and bolts of employee ownership and business strategy, and is driven by a firm belief that a truly democratic society needs capital and community. Um, so welcome both of you, and feel free to share your screen or start your presentation. Uh, David, thank you so much. And Shelly, get um, started. Can you? Uh, uh, Michelle uh, gave the acronym ICA. Can you just uh, uh, preface that with giving folks um, what ICA uh, stands for and then the work of the organization, which you do nationally as well as internationally? Okay. I don't really think that ICA currently stands for uh, anything. Okay. Uh, maybe once long ago, Dave did, did it stand for Industrial yeah, so Cooperative when... Association or something? 
So yeah, so it's important to note. So there's so ICA was formed in 1977, um, and the people who formed it like should have thought like, oh, there's another ICA in that. So we are not the International Cooperative Alliance. We are the uh, we are the ICA group, um, and it's the uh, uh, initially it was the Industrial Cooperative Association. Um, that was what the ICA and ICA group stood for um, initially. Um, uh, but it's um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, we changed it. Uh, um, our name in the eighties. So uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, you know just to give. And by the way, I'm Shelley Miller, the out the outreach manager for ICA, and and Dave is the executive director, who will primarily be. Uh, giving you the governance lesson today. I'll be hopping in and out where needed, but mostly here for any uh, question and answer sessions uh, that we, we are able to conduct. But to give you a little more of the history of the ICA group, we are the oldest national organization dedicated to supporting democratic employee ownership, uh, developing cooperatives in particular, and we have developed numerous innovative systems and structures designed to support businesses in both operational performance and employee engagement. And of course, when we talk business, we mean employee owned um, businesses. I think Dave kind of mentioned um, the founders who founded the organization, I guess, back in 1978 as the Industrial Cooperative Association, as he said. And they were inspired by the Madragona experiment, which I'm sure you all are probably familiar with now that you've been going to the academy. Um, that experiment is, of course, from northern Spain, and they wanted to to bring that unique ownership structure, and entrepreneurial development model, um, to the U.S. and expand on it, which is what the ICA group has been dedicated to doing um, for some years now, uh, and certainly from '78 to, to '83, uh, really kind of established things, and. Um, were able to get organizations established in a few states uh, like Maine, Connecticut, New York, Vermont, Washington, Oregon, and Ohio, and of course, Massachusetts, uh, which is where we're headquartered in terms of getting legislation that was friendly to establishing uh, these businesses. Uh, I work particularly with a program called the Work of Corporate Business Development Initiative in New York City, which is focused on getting existing, but at least my part, ICA's part of the focus is on converting uh, traditional businesses to the worker-owned model. We are supported by the New York City uh, Council and New York City has kind of been a leader in terms of government supporting this movement. Our most recent initiative through Mayor de Blasio was something that he calls Employee Ownership NYC, which basically is funding and supporting a hotline for businesses to call who may want to look at employee ownership as a way of um, coming through the recovery from COVID. So one of the reasons we're, we're working with the Network for Developing Conscious Communities, besides me meeting Ron and, and really connecting with him well, is that ICA is committed to um, using some of its work to close the racial wealth gap. And one thing we want to do is form strong and really committed relationships with black led organizations and be true allies. So um, the network for developing conscious communities is, is one of our um, strong ones we've been able to develop as well as there's a newer one called the urban cooperative initiative, which will also be probably doing some work with with Ron. So without further ado, uh, I will turn this over to Dave. He's already been introduced to you, so I don't think I need to do any more of, of that. Um, so Dave, uh, w one thing I, I would want to mention is that Dave has written um, a couple of articles and things that I, I think is something any of you might want to read. One in particular is called The Framework for Democratic Control, an Introduction to Articles of Incorporation and Bylaws for Democratic Firms. So I recommend that. Dave, you ready? I am. Uh, can folks hear me? All right. Um, 
So here is Shelley and my contact information. Um, one thing I will say is uh, there's a we're going to do a bunch of uh, sort of reference a bunch of resources in this presentation, um, and so uh, I'll I'll make sure that um, those get sent out to everyone. So um, so I've got all that stuff collected, uh, including this the the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so we'll make sure all that stuff is available for folks. Um, but that includes the thing like that Shelley was talking about the, that framework for democratic control. Um, but on the democratic management side of things, um, we have uh, there's a bunch of resources that we'll reference that we're not going to get into. I've got copies of all that stuff, and I can send it to, to, to folks um, to, to get into the weeds of it. Um, so as um, so, I start by talking. Let's not get into the, there we go. Um, I want to start by talking about ICA's mission. Um, so ICA's mission is to change the nature of work by advancing businesses and institutions that center worker voice, grow worker wealth, and build worker power. Um, and for us, the, you know, the, the, the central thing to achieve that is democracy. Um, so you know, we look at, I think, cooperatives as an incredibly important part of the the work that we're doing in creating a truly democratic society, um, but it's a you know it's sort of a means to an end in in a lot of ways for us. Um, uh, so it's not cooperatives for the sake of cooperatives; it's cooperatives for the sake of democracy. And ICA, we really focus on employee-owned um, companies. Um, and I think this this quote here from Robert Dahl, who is a sociologist, um, uh, he wrote a book, and it's. It's called the, a preface to economic democracy. Um, but I think this quote is worth sort of exploring a little bit. And so, so I'm gonna read it. Um, if democracy is justified in governing the state, then it mu must also be justified in governing economic enterprises. And to say that it's not justified in governing economic enterprises is to imply that it's not justified in governing the state. Um, and, and I think it's important to note, like when we go to work, we enter a dictatorship. That's, you know, unless it's a cooperative. Um, uh, democracy is, you know, ends at the, you know, in, in, in the, um, for most people's jobs. Um, and if we believe that democracy is um, a right of ours, um, a right that's often denied, a right that is often undermined, a right, right that is often attacked. But if we believe that democracy is a right of ours in the political sphere, um, then it, then it follows that it should be right in the economic sphere. Um, and so that's sort of really, I think, in a lot of ways, like a driving philosophy of how we approach our work. Um, and so how do we build a democratic organization? Um, so we look at this as really having three components of a democratic. Um, there are three really sort of key components of a democratic organization. Um, and we're going to spend the most of the time here talking about the governance system, but the foundation of a lot of this is the legal structure. So we're going to cover that a little bit. And then there's a management system that operates in parallel or, you know, in, you know, alongside the governance system and the governance system. But these three kind of elements of the business um, are necessary in order to have um, a democratic organization. Um, and uh, one of the things, um, when I was talking about earlier was uh, leadership. Um, and, I, and I love this quote from uh, Ella Baker um, uh, around, it's not about people sort of, you know, finding people who want to be leaders. It's about finding people who want to make leaders out of other people. Um, and folks may know Ella Baker from SNCC, from one of the founders of the um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, but an important thing that I think a lot of people don't necessarily know about, and we have really, you know, uh, uh, folks haven't read Collective Courage, Jessica Gordon, Gordon Emhart's book about um, uh, the sort of long history of um, black cooperatives in the United States. Um, Ella Baker got her start in cooperative work in the 1930s. Um, and so the relationship between uh, cooperatives and the civil rights movement, I think, is really um, one that we need to, to, to stress because um, it's sort of a history that is, um, whether it's forgotten or whether it's suppressed, I think is um, an open question, um, but it's not sort of present enough. Um, but this sort of leadership is really the center of this. Um, 
And I think that's a really important piece for us to, you know, to keep, keep in mind. Um, so we think about the legal, legal structure. So the legal structure for a corp, this is like sort of that first foundation. So it provides the framework in which governments can take place um, and establishes the democratic rights of members, right? That's sort of what it does. And it really has sort of three components to it. And I'm gonna use some, an analogy here with in terms of the United States government, the federal government, um, to hopefully um, make some, some clarity around this. Um, so one is sort of one of the sort of foundational pieces is the Articles of Incorporation. That's kind of like the Constitution, right? Sometimes that's called a operating agreement if it's an LLC or Articles of Organization. Um, but it's the, you know, it's a sort of a, you know, it's in a very critical, but a sort of simple um, uh, document that sort of lays the foundation for the business. Um, you then have bylaws. Bylaws are kind of like the laws that the, that the, that the company um, creates. Uh, and those obviously get more detailed um, and they change over time and they're easier to change, right? You can change the articles of incorporation, but it's difficult. The bylaws are easier to change, but it's also, you know, it, it requires votes of the, um, you know, sometimes the membership, sometimes the board of directors, um, but it's sort of the laws of the company. Um, but there's this third piece, which is around policies or systems. And those are like the regulations. Um, and that's where our governance system sits, right? Our governance system is sort of the framework is outlined in the articles and in the bylaws, but the nuts and bolts of it really sit in the policies, um, the living document um, that changes. Um, uh, we do that. Now, this is every company. This isn't just co-ops, right? Every company has this sort of framework of the um, articles and, and bylaws and, and policies or regulations. Um, so how do we think about this from a, from a democratic strand, uh, framework? Um, and we really think that there's sort of three elements to that. So one is how we think about money, right? And so in a co-op, that's about how owners or members enter, how they leave, how profits is how profits are distributed. We think about power, right? Um, the rights of the owners, the rights of the board. Are there going to be outside investors? How can changes be made? How can policies be set? Um, who has the power to do that? And then information. When are meetings going to be happening? Um, the financial performance of the company, communications around things. If you don't have, you know, if you don't have, if you have a right to money, but no information around it, right? It doesn't do a whole lot of good, right? Um, and so we really see these th these things as sort of three core elements of of building out a um, an effective um, democratic system. Um, and this all happens in the you know in the articles and the bylaws. Um, so that's not something we're going to be talking about today in any detail, but it's it's an important you know foundational piece of it. Um, now we are going to talk about this next piece a little bit late at sort of at the end, which is like the management system. Um, and the management system uh, is, you know, it operates alongside the governance system. Um, it's, it is its scope of power, right? Like what the management system can do, what the managers in a co-op can do with the And managers can mean a lot of different things. It can mean managers, um, it can mean leadership, it can mean, um, you know, a collective if it's all with the staff. There's lots of ways to think about that. Um, uh, um, but oftentimes it's sort of as a person, right? So Audrey Powell, she's the president of Cooperative Home Care Associates. She's the sort of head, she's the president CEO. She's the head sort of manager at the, you know, at this, at this worker co-op. Um, and there's lots of ways you could think about, um, uh, you know, how we think about, you know, management system. There's, so we're going to talk about some of these things later, um, but, you know, you've got sort of, participatory open book management systems like the great game of business. There's sociocracy, which is a system of um, kind of collective decision-making. There's holacracy, which is sort of an outgrowth of sociocracy. Um, and what I have on the side here is just some resources that I think are really helpful. So Lucid Meetings, this is a company that sells a meeting software, um, but because they sell a meeting software, they put a lot of time and energy in creating free resources around how to run effective meetings. Um, so Lucid Meetings, their blog and their articles is really, really got like it's and and sometimes it's not going to resonate and that's OK. But there's lots of resources that are out there around that. Um, Round Sky Solutions is another company um, that does uh, um, sort of co-op governance and they sort of have a specialization in sociocracy. 
um, Sociocracy for All and Rab Sky Solutions are two organizations that have a focus on sociocracy. Um, and then folks should be aware that the Democracy at Work Institute has a school for democratic management. Um, this is a new, a relatively new initiative um, that's coming out of the US Federation of Workers Cooperatives and the Demet Democracy at Work Institute. Um, and they have just put out a really great resource on democratic management um, uh, and they run courses um, throughout the, um, uh, the year. Um, uh, and so definitely check them out. Um, all right, so the governance system. Uh, now the reality is like in our governance systems, we have meetings, right? But we're gonna put this picture here is like a lot of, of our governance system is around meetings. Um, uh, and so we have, uh, um, uh, as folks know, in co-ops, we, we like our meetings. Um, I want to just very briefly sort of talk about like on the governance side of things, what we're going to cover and what we're not going to cover. Um, so we're going to talk about the framework for democratic governance. Um, I want to admit it is primarily from a worker co-op perspective. That is where we are focused. So I try to make it sort of applicable um, for folks who are doing housing co-ops or who are doing um, consumer co-ops. Right? So there, but there, there are meaningful differences between a consumer co-op and a housing co-op or a purchasing co-op and a worker co-op in terms of how they think about governance. Um, and those distinctions, there's lessons we can learn from, I think, each, you know, other sectors. Um, but there's also things that might not, you know, sort of fit in exactly. Um, we're not going to talk about policy governance. We're not going to talk about Robert's rules. We're not going to talk about sort of the, you know, every type of co-op governance. Um, uh, we're we're going to really focus on a sort of ICA's framework. Um, so, and we covered, this, this actually was covered earlier really well, so I'm gonna go through quickly, just for time-wise. Um, what is governance? So, governance is that system of rules and practices, what we talked about, you know, what was laid out earlier. Um, a democratic system, though, is really um, designed to, and this is what we're really gonna focus in on, it's designed to delineate and address the issues that are best left to the membership, the issues that are best left to the board, and the issues that are best left to management or other leadership. And that distinction between those three groups is really critical. Um, uh, just time-wise, I'm gonna skip past this one. All right, so decision makers. We talked, we sort of referenced them earlier. In a governance system, there are really three key decision makers. And this is the basic, basic, basic piece of what, what these folks do. So you have the membership at, a sim at the most basic level, the membership elects the board on a one person or one member, one vote basis, and they make changes to the bylaws. Now they can do a lot more than that and maybe should do a lot more than that, but at the basic level, that's what the membership is sort of designed um, minimally to do. The board of directors, they set policy, they select and they supervise the CEO. So they are the policy guidance and they select the key leadership in the organization. Um, that is their sort of minimal power. Um, and in a worker co-op, um, the management is then ensures is, is um, supervises the membership, but they also, and in, and in worker co-op, the membership is the staff, right? So it's this sort of circle of accountability. Um, but management's basic minimal role is to ensure policies carried out, the policy that the board scrapes, and they hire and they supervise and you know, staff and hold them, make sure they're being held accountable. We're gonna come back to these sort of three groups all the time um, uh, in, this, um, in this process. So I just wanna sort of, you know, um, uh, make sure folks have sort of uh, you know, an understanding of it. Um, the details here, we, you know, I think we probably got a good handle of this. Um, so this is sort of how we define the membership um, and uh, the board of directors and the, um, and the um, and the, and the management a little bit more detail. I'm going to skip through these. Um, they'll be in the in the PowerPoint, so folks have them. Um, but just sort of end off with the um, with the sort of the the, the the group of all three of these here. Um, and um, I think an important piece here to, to name though here is that like the and we'll talk about this again in a, in, a, in a little bit um, is that uh, the members are the shareholders. And they are fundamentally responsible for all the corporate matters. Um, 
they delegate that responsibility to members or to the board of directors, who then delegate some of that responsibility to the management, right? But that shareholders are sort of fundamentally the, the folks, um, the members are fundamentally folks who are sort of responsible for this. Um, and, uh, and I think that's an important thing for us to, to remember. I'm gonna pause here to sort of see if anybody's got questions, comments, um, uh, but I would also just encourage folks, if you've got questions or comments, me now okay uh, I, I will just say I, I, I get a little um, a little noise in my um, uh, headphone when my uh, the sort of connector thing I have goes goes out for some reason um, so uh, I um, apologize for that um, uh, So as I was saying, folks have questions, comments, any of that stuff. Um, just you know, feel free to unmute yourself um, and, and 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 jump right in with any questions you've got here. Um, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. This is Damon Tazia. I'm out of Indianapolis. Forgive me if you can't hear me. I'll try to speak up. Um, and maybe just towards the end of the conversation, kind of this, and I've heard about it in the nonprofit space in terms of. Um, Wow, I just drew a blank. But worker managed cooperatives, where in fact, like, it's kind of more of a um, kind of a, a more of a flat organization, um, and how like smaller teams are kind of broken out into manage and have more power consolidated in those teams versus kind of the traditional hierarchical structure um, of a cooperative or a nonprofit, and how. You know they're they're kind of made to stand up teams around certain impact issues and be more agile in terms of more of the decision making powers within those smaller teams and groups. So, be interested in hearing like, in a lot of ways that that is how a cooperative is, but still kind of sensing this a, a sense of like a lot of hierarchy here. No, so that's a really good that's a really good point and 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 you know part of the reason I have these sort of two little cartoons here of a single person versus a group of people in the management is and and we're talking about this in the democratic management side of things the management system right can be um can be set up in a lot of different ways right so I talked about sociocracy and holacracy those are very flat um you know really distributed decision making systems right the great game of business is a open book management. It, you might use a hierarchical kind of like supervisor, manager um, type structure, but with a lot of participation. So there's lots of different ways to think about um, establishing a, man a management system, right? Um, uh, the, the key thing around that is, you know, they are different, you know, and it's, and, and what we'll talk about in that section, where I'll, one of the things I'll mention there is, a lot of it is around like kind of building that culture and being intentional around it. And what do you want to do? Um, uh, so what here, here, this is really focused in on sort of the, the, the governance system. Um, and there are co-ops that have um, a membership and they don't have a separate board of directors, right? Where the membership and the board are the same. And, and that's a fine system, right? Like that's a great system um, if it works, right? Um, when it doesn't work, it's a it's a it's a bad system, right? I mean that's and Dave, did you are you speaking? Because we don't hear you again. I'm speaking. Um, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, my um, this is a really frustrating process. Um, every few minutes, uh, the little thing sort of pops out and says, um, 
I can hear it sort of kick, kicks me off the, the, the microphone. Um, that, um, but so that system, right, like finding the, the, the right governance system for co-op is really critical. And there's not, there's not a right or wrong answer on that, right? Um, it's what we, what, what we really want to do here is we really want to sort of lay out, like, there are roles for the members, there are roles for the board, and you can make a system where those are the same people, but they still have to put on different hats, right? They, and we'll talk about that explicitly in a little bit. Sometimes you're, you know, a member hat, sometimes you're a board hat, sometimes you're a worker hat. Um, uh, and sort of, you know, making sure you're sort of delineating those things is really important. Um, uh, so that's a, you know, that is a sort of that interplay is really critical. But on management, there's lots of ways we can think about building a sort of a leadership system um, within a business. Um, so what, I'm going to talk here about like this sort of model governance system. For, that we we have, and this is we have a, a publication called a um, democratic governance um, a framework for uh, um, uh, sort of building a, a democratic governance system for worker-owned companies. It has, um, you know, so this is sort of the sort of the model one. There, the, in that document, which I'll, I'll make sure folks get after the fact, there are kind of variations on this for thinking about larger co-ops versus smaller co-ops, and how you can think about the variations of this. Um, but this is, you know, this is a model for like probably a, you know, a 20 person co-op or something like that is probably the, um, the basis here. Um, and the, the center of this is you've got, you know, you've got these, um, you've got these sort of three components, right? The membership, the board and management. Um, inevitably, the board has got different things that it needs to deal with. Um, uh, and if you've got, you know, larger board, um, uh, you oftentimes want to have committees um, uh, to, to handle those things. So they are committees of the board. Um, now, membership can also have committees as well. Um, a committee that we really stress that co-ops have is what's called a grievance council. Um, and a grievance council is really, um, a, you know, sort of an explicit body that's designed to address conflict and problems that are going to come up and how do you address that from a policy perspective, right? So disagreement, conflict um, are inevitable. How you deal with it is 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 not. Um, and so we really stress, like you know, having this grievance council is really critical. So these are sort of the components, and what we're going to talk about today is sort of how they interact with each other. And we have a sort of series of tests um, that we use to decide. When you talk about an issue, or when an issue is there, who is it an issue for, right? So is it an issue for that the board of directors should decide or that management should decide on, right? Um, and so we, we have this test called the extensiveness test that we'll get into on that. Is it a question that the board of directors should decide or that the membership should be consulted on or decide? And that's like a significance test. Is it significant enough to, to bring to the membership? And then we have this grievability test, which is, is it is this an issue that management should decide, like a, a conflict that like leadership should decide, or is this something that requires a policy, <clears throat> a policy issue um, and therefore should be addressed at the grievance council level, right? So we have these sort of three tests. Um, and we really encourage folks to sort of go through these tests in their, in their as they're designing their, thing, their, their pieces, you know, as they're designing their governance system, and start writing down like what is extensive, what is significant, what is you know grievable, um, so that you have sort of real clarity around around these things, and that these are living documents, right? Um, uh, what you start off with on day one versus what you get on day you know like year one are going to be different. Um, the other piece is um, uh, that I think is an important one is. Um, for us to think about is that for all of these decision maker, there are these spheres of influences. Um, and we're gonna talk about these in a little bit of detail, um, but there are, you know, management board and members all have influence over policy, over finances, over personnel, over operations and over strategy. And they have responsibilities around those as well, right? So there's rights, there's responsibilities. Um, 
and on the sustainability of the of the of the co-op um, and of that institute, you know, of, of that that group of, of decision makers. Um, so that is, um, you know, the, the, we're going to sort of go through these tests, but each for each of these areas, we're going to sort of lay out some of these different issues for folks to um, uh, get into. Uh, so um, earlier, I think we did a great job of, of going through like why um, good governance is important. All of those issues, um, you know, burnout, um, uh, sort of disagreement, lack of clarity, you know, and and those are really you know really big issues. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to get into those um, uh, right now just for time. So we get a little bit more time on the democratic management stuff. Um, but uh, this resource here, this little chart um, chart here, which I like, it's from uh, this group called The Hive, which is a UK based. It's Cooperatives UK. Um, I thought this was a really um, sort of interesting visual display of sort of what governance, um, you know, uh, the key elements of governance. Um, and uh, and so I, I just, you know, for me, it's, you know, it's, it's, I just looked at this and I thought like, oh, here's something that, you know, um, as you're sort of examining or evaluating your own governance system, um, you can sort of understand and identify like, oh, are we, are we addressing these things? It's a good kind of Simple, you know, sort of um, unified checklist or unified um, framework to think about stuff. Um, uh, and I think this is just a lesson of there's lots of resources and materials um, in the in the co-op space. Some stuff, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming. Um, I think part of the goal for us today is to highlight some of the resources that we find particularly helpful, and, and um, so that you've got them going forward for your you know, your business. Um, as you develop it. Um, all right, so we're going to jump off with the the board's role. Um, talk about one, you know, the first group we're talking about is the is the board, um, and uh, and so you know, here's Bernie with his bird um, talking about um, you know he wants uh, workers to be able to sit on corporate boards and just say over their lives, um, and I think there's a um, in the employee ownership field and in the worker cooperative field, especially, um, they sound. We can't hear you again, Dave. Sorry, guys. Give us a sec. Sorry about that. I'm back. Okay. That. Yes. Um, uh, so there's a real, you know, real, um, I think, meaningful connection to um, uh, some some uh, uh, the social justice movements um, uh, and the sort of key progressive elements of the um, uh, that. But I think it's important for folks to remember or to be aware of, uh, maybe not to remember, but to be aware of um, that uh, we've got some um, uh, interesting. Um, support on the on the right. So here's Ronald Reagan talking about employee ownership in the 1980s, um, and it's interesting when, when you sort of talk about the employee ownership space. You've got you know the the most dominant form of employee ownership in the United States is ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, and there are really wonderful, great folks in the ESOP space. It is a bipartisan issue. Um, uh, and so in that sense, um, it's, uh, um, we, especially when we think about policy, you know, sort of policy achievements um, and policy objectives that we can achieve or things we can achieve through policy, which is necessary. Um, I think it's just an important thing to note that um, uh, oftentimes we think Republicans are gonna be in opposition to things we care about in employee ownership side and around cooperatives writ large, sometimes um, they are not necessarily opposed. Um, uh, which gives us some, you know, creates an opportunity at least. So here we come back to the board of directors, right? Um, the key thing here is the board is responsible for kind of all policy um, and governance matters that are not handled by the membership, right? This is this delegated power powder, and this delegated power, um, and these are kind of the five. Um, uh, or these, these in these six sort of spheres in terms of these roles, um, this is sort of the roles that we sort of see as for the board, right? Um, 
So they're setting policy and they're ensuring legal compliance. They are fundamentally, at the end of the day, they're responsible for ensuring that the business is financially healthy. That's like kind of a piece that sticks with the board. Um, on a personnel matter, they have a really narrow role of, of choosing the top and supervising the top leadership um, or holding the top leadership accountable, um, but not necessarily, you know, getting involved in the sort of um, the, um, the day to day personnel issues or for that matter, the day-to-day -day operations issues, right? So the, this sphere of influence is more of, you know, it's, it's more limited for the board, the personnel and the operations. Um, but for strategy, it's really critical. Their job is to um, ensure that there is a plan and that it's on track. Um, for sustainability, one of the things that we really stress is that, um, uh, and, and, you know, earlier, uh, um, uh, saw the, um, Sort of the, the tenure rates for for different co-ops and how how long you know folks um and i think ron you were saying you know you're not going to get more than three years is that the the number you put out um uh, yeah i, I was saying two to, three, uh, two to three yeah so i think that's that's totally right um and so what key thing is for a board, you've got to make sure that it's as strong, that it's engaged, and that you're bringing new members on. Um, and that requires education, that requires you know, training, that requires thought in terms of finding who those folks are. Um, we actually encourage um, uh, companies to, to, to craft a job description for their boards, um, like actually, and they can, they can, they can vary, um, and actually have folks sign it. Um, uh, you know, that there's a commitment to this. Um, and if you're, you know, running it on election, it's sort of, you know, making sure that, um, you know, before anybody is, um, you know, uh, um, running for, for a board seat, that they commit to, you know, if they are successful and they win, that they'll commit to this job description. Um, so we talk about these sort of five core elements for a board job description. Jobs description. Um, so one is it's around the assets um, are you know securely held, right? That's fundamentally the key thing that you're in doing as a board member is making sure um, that the assets of the members, the money of the members, um, are being managed uh, effectively. Um, uh, but that you're also sort of making sure that there's a vision, you know, clear vision, that there's an effective leadership system in place, um, that there, um, uh, and that over time that the co-op maintains its value to the members. Um, we also sort of stress that, you know, board members need to be accountable to the members. They need to act in the best interest of the co-op. They need to spend the time and the energy to stay informed, right? There's a right and a responsibility, right? So the responsibility of a board member is, um, uh, you know, to be, you know, to be educated, to understand what's going on um, and what their role is and what the limits of um, so we have a document, it's a, sort of a model board policy that we can share with folks um, that lays out kind of what the job description is. Folks can take that and adjust it um, as, as, you know, as they see fit. Um, uh, so we talk about the board, right? So coming back to this, um, uh, this board um, at the center of the, um, uh, at the center of the, of this um, uh, sort of model governance system. Um, we're going to talk about the grievance council specifically in a little bit, but within a um, uh, within a board, you've got these committees. So these are just some sort of ideas, of kind of committees that we you know, folks might think about: governance committees, finance committees, on um, strategic planning or long range planning, management oversight, personnel, education, and executive. Some of these can be standing committees, which means that they're there and they're always around. Some of them can be ad hoc committees on an ad hoc basis. And some boards meet regularly, like all the time, like they're meeting every month, they're meeting every three weeks, or, you know, they're, they're sort of much more frequent meetings, in which case, you know, you know, they're handling a lot, a lot of this stuff internally. Um, but thinking about these kind of areas is really um, important in terms of like, what are the kinds of, of, of spaces you're going to have? What are the kinds of roles that the board is going to have? Um, uh, so the other key piece you think you need to think about is that they're officers in a board, right? Um, and 
Um, so these are some of the, the, um, the women um, who are part of the um, different home care co-ops around the country. Um, we, we, we run a network um, uh, of um, 14 um, active or operating um, uh, uh, worker-owned home care agencies. Um, ICA is helping launch, um, you know, help these folks work together. And we've held these national conferences. These are some of the women um, who attended that who are board um, officers at their co-ops. Um, in that board policy document that, that I'll share, um, it sort of lays out kind of the basics of what the president does, that what the chairperson does, the vice chair, the secretary, or sometimes they're called the clerk, and what the treasurer is. Now, you can have these roles be specific or, um, uh, you know, you, you can legally oftentimes have one person fill multiple roles in this, um, but that means that they have to do both of those jobs, and that's hard, right? Um, and so we really look at and see, you know, you're going to want to have somebody who is um, you know, taking on each of these roles individually. Um, in, a, in some consumer co-ops, the chairperson and the president are sort of definitionally the same thing. Um, in most worker co-ops, the president of the corporation is the CEO, um, and that is a different person than the chairperson who's elected. Um, so the, you know, they're, they're, differences of, of how people talk about this stuff. We at ICA make a distinction between the president and the chair. Um, we, but we do recommend that you've got a vice chair um, because the vice chair is somebody who's gonna be helping the chair um, and is there in case the vice, the chairperson's not, not there. Um, and just having, you know, if you're having a meeting and the, and the chairperson isn't there, you've got somebody who can step in um, and who's ready to take on that role. Um, so these are kind of the, the, the key, you know, um, roles and, and, and frameworks for the, uh, for the board. Um, when we talk about management, um, and, and we talked earlier about that extensiveness test, is it a management role or, or a board role? And, and once we get through sort of what's, what management's role, we're going to get into that. Um, uh, and I want to come back to this issue of, of leadership, right? Um, uh, and managers as as uh, as teachers. So Chuck Turner, who unfortunately passed away a number of years ago in the early 1980s, was the education director for the ICA group, and and he wrote this great piece um, uh, that actually we just found in our archives. It's a wonderful piece, but he talks about sort of managers as teachers. Um, you know uh, that that it's really an educational role, um, and you know, uh, and I think that it's a it's a piece that really does. Um, uh, uh, resonate because it's about unearthing um, sort of the power that exists. Um, so management role, um, you know, they're effectively responsible for the operations of the company. Inevitably, they have an enormous amount of influence. Um, they're the people who are closest to um, the, the details of customers, the details of finances, the details of um, staff, the details of sort of the interplay between staff. Um, and management can be one person, like I said, it can be a group of people, it can be a very flat system. There's lots of ways to think about management. Um, one of the key things is because they have so much influence and because they have so much information, building checks against their power is really critical. Um, uh, and so the, 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 the board is sort of meant to sort of be this guide and the management is um, you know, sort of designed to sort of oversee um, how it can be done and the best way to approach it. Um, but it's important to sort of build that check against management because it can be an easy thing for, um, uh, for people to sort of ignore the members, ignore the board. Um, uh, over time, um, if you don't have sort of an effective governance system. Um, these are sort of the key areas. You can sort of, you know, some of this stuff I think is pretty self evident. Management has a big role in executing on policy, it develops budgets and monitors progress on those budgets, but it's, you know, um, it sort of hires, trains, supervises staff. Um, and it sort of has a deep, deep role in the operations. Um, it, it has a lot of influence around strategy and it has a lot of influence um, around uh, sustainability, um, but, but, 
but at the end of the day, we really want to make sure that the members and the board um, are 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 um, you know are, are playing a key role in there. Um, so we talked earlier about what does management look like, um, and so here's just sort of you know a few examples of what management can look like. Um, so on the on the far right here, we have Rainbow Grocery. So Rainbow Grocery is a really really flat. Um, organization um, uh, based out of San Francisco. Way back. Um, sorry about that again. Uh, but you've got sort of this very flat, you can have a very flat management system. Um, you can have a uh, um, kind of, you know, a group of team, a team that could be the management uh, managers, the top managers, or you could have one person, right? So PV Squared and Alvarado Street Bakery. Um, so Alvarado Street Bakery is a really interesting example. It's a, bake, a worker-owned um, bakery, um, incredibly successful, really, really, you know, like amazing, amazing jobs. Um, they have very little middle management. Um, they're incredibly flat, but they have sort of a very centered um, uh, CEO role. Um, uh, so they have one person who's sort of at the top, um, but then they have incredibly self-directed teams. And I think that's an important piece is that like management doesn't necessarily have to equal hierarchy, right? That every management system can take on, you know, can take on different roles. Um, and there are lots of ways you can think about the structure versus how you're thinking about the execution of it. Um, so we've talked about who management is, we've talked about the board, so let's talk about the dynamic between them. So this is the first, the sort of the first test, um, the extensiveness test. Is it a matter for management or for the board? Um, so the key questions we wanna ask here are, does, does this sort of affect the likely survival of the co-op? Um, does it have to do with policies for hiring or terminating co-op members? Does it matter affect the basic character of the co-op? Um, these are all things that we don't think are kind of, you know, um, appropriate for management to be dealing with. Um, but one of the key things is, you know, what's what's an appropriate issue for the board and what's an appropriate issue for management is a really important one. Um, and I'm just curious if folks could sort of, you know, if folks are out there, you know, to sort of identify, you know, some questions, you know, some issues or some ideas that you might have come up in your co-op or, you know, even in your, um, you know, in, in, in your, in another organization being part of. Um, and uh, um, sort of think through like, you know, yeah, is this a, a management issue or a, or, a, or a board issue? Anybody have an idea on that? I mean, I am. Um... We're more so a nonprofit looking to, to set up a cooperative, but one thing that kind of is driven to the board, like you said, is just in terms of directionally where we go as an organization. Um, other kind of board um, issues are, you know, setting budgets, um, you know, 12, 12 month um, financial reviews and things of that nature. Um, in our organizations, it's a little, you know, it's, it's kind of a more flat where, you know, policies and procedures are kind of by self-organizing teams or committees um, within the overall within the overall organization. Um, it's, but but but, you know, that was at like a ten person, and as we've kind of expanded to seventeen, twenty people, it, it feels like inevitably. There's going to be some management hierarchy that's, that has to be set in place, unfortunately. But we're yeah. trying to, you know, figure that out as well. How to still still leave agency and information flow within, you know, self-organizing groups versus kind of having to sit in these hierarchical man manager positions. So let's look at that budget, you know, that budget question. So so for like the annual, the twelve-month budget, the annual budget. So is in terms of making the decision of adopting what that is. So who, where, where do folks think that that's like management's role or the board's role? Does anybody think it's it's management's role? 
I think it's the board's role. Um, but I would agree. I think it is the board's role. Um, uh, it's um, so. What about um, creating a new position? Not so, hiring a vacancy, like not like oh somebody quit or somebody you know was terminated, but like oh we need a new development director or we need a new um, you know we we need to hire you know we're we're trying to sell more so we need new communication stuff so we're going to hire a position of like you know the director of communications and marketing. I would say management if if, if board has set budget for a particular initiative and given management the authority to you know move it forward that that could be considered something that management will facilitate i think it's the board so, so there you've got some disagreement and you know what there's not a right answer i mean that's the thing for one organization it might be the board's decision right um for another organization it might be the, the member's decision right um uh but there's not there's not necessarily a right answer um, and it, and that's something that might change over time uh, um, as 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 well. Um, uh, but but I think one of the things that um, uh, um, one of the things that came up around that uh, um, was if it's in the budget, right? It's almost like the board said in the budget you can create these positions, right? So they've delegated that authority. Um, but if you were creating a position outside of the budget, right, you got to go back to the board to get, um, uh, you know, permission around that, right? So in some, so 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 and so there's and there's nuances in this, and it's really important. I we think it's really important for co-ops to to have like a list, right? Like have a you know like have something you know have something spelled out here. Um, so I give you an example at ICA. Um, at ICA Group, so I'm the executive director. Um, I have the authority to spend up to ten thousand dollars without asking. Um, and and we sort of in practice, we actually make it five thousand dollars because ten thousand dollars feels like a lot of money. Um, but uh, we technically have sort of ten thousand. I can spend up to ten thousand dollars without asking the board's permission, right? And if we have to go, if it's twenty-five thousand dollars, and this is outside of a sort of a, a staff person, um, if it's out above twenty-five thousand dollars, we have to go to the the um, uh, the the, um, the board of uh, or the, the membership, right, to make that decision. Um, and so that's a number that we felt, you know, kind of comfortable with, right? But a, a bigger organization, right? I'm on the board of an organization that's, you know, is has a it's a, a, a not a cop co-op, but it's a, um, it's a it's a very large home care company, um, and there, uh, you know, they 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 have there's forty thousand people employed by this company. There, for that that situation, that number is like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? Like there's you know the, the 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 that the difference between what the management can do there is significantly different um, uh, because of the nature of the organization. Um, and in each one is really different and important, but it's it's laying out kind of what that distinction is. Um, uh, so this test, I think, is really a critical one. Um, what we don't want to let happen is have managers taking over the policy making responsibilities of the board. Um, and uh, and we also don't want to have the board take over the operations of the business. Right. So if if you're telling the board, like if the board is saying you can only spend, you know, you have to get a permission to spend fifty dollars or one hundred and fifty dollars. Right. That can get into the, you know, every day you might be having to do some, you know, things like that and get permission. Um, and maybe that's right and maybe that's wrong. Um, but it's a dynamic that you need to play, you know, play through. Um, How often then would the workers also be on the board of directors uh I, I and when i say workers i mean this is going to depend a lot on what what kind of a co-op we have going on because 
Yeah. Okay. The the members, and then but if you have a taxi cab company that is made up mostly of the taxi cab drivers that are the ones that are making the money to bring in, you know, the the, the income of the the money there, they should have a say in actually even who manages them who are their managers or who are their CEOs or do they want to be on one of the boards of the CEOs or is that too much responsibility? So there's, you know, there's still a lot that I'm trying to mix around in my head to figure out how, what kind of a co-op could we end up having here in the Las Vegas area? And, 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 the, that's exactly the kind of questions you want to be you want to be exploring. And and what we try to do with this is to give a framework to think about that answer. Not because I don't we don't know what the answer is, and it could change over time, right? When you're starting off with a small group of people, right? Who that man you know who that manager is, right? When you're first hiring a manager, having that manager get the buy-in from all the you know if it's drivers, right? All those drivers might make sense. But if you've got 800 drivers, right, it's a pretty hard decision to go sort of get like an approval of like, oh, we're going to have this, you know, have like, it's just logistically really hard to do that. Um, and so you might then say, okay, we're going to, we're going to delegate that to the board of directors, right, a small group, which should be made up of drivers, right, or have some drivers on it. Right. Um, uh, and, um, uh and so you're going to delegate some of that responsibility, and 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 you know, and those board members are voted on if it's if those drivers are members, those board members are voted on by those members. Yes. Um, all right, so let's get to membership. Um, uh, so uh, this this quote is is a, a quote from W. E. B. Du Bois. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that's just, you know, one of the things that I sort of try to do on this is uh, is try to identify um, some quotes that connect um, to some of the history of, of, of co-op development. And I don't know if folks are sort of familiar or how familiar they are or aren't um, with Du Bois' uh, role in um, cooperative economics. Um, but he definitely was a lot of sort of the theoretically and underpinnings of sort of how he approached um, uh, um, sort of what, how and why economic development should happen um, uh, really resonate um, to, you know, with the, uh, the co-op um, uh, piece. Um, but it's, it's and, and he's really primarily, you know, a, a, was a real proponent of education. Um, and I think that's a really central piece of like, if we don't have a, an informed um, uh, and educated, engaged uh, membership, um, then they're not going to be able to be sort of, you know, meet their full potential. Um, as members. Um, so educating members is really a critical piece of this. Um, so um, we talked about who members are as decision makers. Um, when you are a member, you wear many hats. Um, you can wear a, in a worker co-op, you can be an employee, you can be a manager, you can be a member owner, and you can be a board member, all one person, could be all of those things. Or somebody could be just one of those things. Um, the key thing that you need to think about is when you're making a decision, which hat are you wearing, right? Um, uh, and what's the right, you know, because you might, and we sort of look at this, like, you know, in terms of uh, making this, this second question here, should we make a cap, should co-op make a capital investment, right? Now, if you're a member of a co-op, and let's say you're an older member of co-op, you've been at the co-op for 20 years, um, and you want to make, you, you want to ask the question, should, the cap, should, should we make a capital investment in the business, right? And as a member, you might be thinking, no, because that's going to make profits, like less money for profits, and I want profits, and I'm not going to get any of that benefit. Um, and so as a member, you might sort of have some real problems with that. But as a board member, you have a responsibility, you have an obligation to think about the long-term benefits, right? Not just you as a member, but of future members. Um, and uh, it's, um, 
it's just an important mechanism for folks to really be thinking, what kind of decision is this and where, what's, what's the right decision, you know, what's the right hat to be wearing on this decision? Um, the, the other key thing to remember is, is um, the buck stops at them, right? They're fundamentally um, the, uh, you know, the decision makers on corporate questions, not on operation questions, but on corporate questions. Um, and, and so it's, it's really important. Um, but if you don't have effective engagement, members can be, become disengaged and then they just become a rubber stamp. Um, so they have the power, but they don't have, we get back to that money information um, uh, power, right? So they have the power, but they don't have the information, they don't have the engagement to, to exercise that power. Um, so for time, I'm gonna jump over this quick, but the, the, um, the, the key thing here is members have sort of um, like the board have, um, uh, um, you know, a, a sort of more limited role in operations and personnel. Obviously they elect and potentially remove boards of directors, um, uh, but, the, but the members have sort of a l l lesser role in sort of the operations, um, more of a kind of an information and guiding role in all of these areas. Um, so here's this sec second test, the significance test. Um, so the question here is, should the board consult with the members? Um, and sometimes the, it's, you know, should the board let the members vote, right? Or, or should the members vote on something is another piece of this. We think that the answer to this is yes, that the members need to be consulted um, if it affects the survival of the co-op, if it has to do with hiring, um, uh, um, uh, you know, hiring or firing um, co-op members, um, or if it affects the basic character of the co-op. Um, so once again, so anybody got a sort of a question or a not question, uh, sort of a topic, an issue that might be something that is, you know, um, uh, a, a decision that, that needs to be made. It's a question of like, does it sit with the, you know, is it something the board should be allowed to do um, and just report to the members? Or is it something that the board needs to consult with the members before a decision is made? I'm sorry, I had a separate question. Can you define yeah. character? Is that is that around the culture or is it also in indicative indicative of like what the actual co-op works on or goes after? When you say it's character. Cold. Okay. So 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 a concrete example here is and, and we would I would say and we would sort of recommend this is absolutely something the members need to be um engaged, you know, engaged around is are you opening up a new location? Right? So you're a uh, this wasn't a co-op, this is a this was an ESOP, but New Belgium Brewery was based in Colorado. They wanted to open up a new location in South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, right? Now they're an ESOP. They don't have to ask the members that they wanted to do that. Um, uh, and I don't think they did, um, but that's gonna fundamentally change kind of who that company is, right? You're gonna go from being a place where all of your staff are located in one town and one community has been there for 20 years, to all of a sudden having split your staff Across two states in two different, you know, two like real big areas, right? That's going to change the culture. That's going to change the basic character, the, the sort of the operations of that of the company. Um, and so we would argue that's something that should not be, you know, that is not a decision um, uh, of the board of directors should make without consulting the members. Um, a, a good example here, sometimes you can learn from the best, the best examples are where things went real bad. Um, a good example of this, uh, where a co-op made, I'm not gonna name the co-op, but where a co-op made um, a really bad decision, where the board made a really bad decision. Um, this is a co-op that um, had a, basically a money losing, but uh, kind of break even um, uh, distribution operation. Right of you know delivering their product, um, it connected to them community. It had a bunch of jobs. It was you know, but it kind of lost some money. Right, it wasn't. It didn't lose a ton of money, but it it it, it kind of didn't break even. Um, now the company made great profits. Right overall. Right, people were getting ten thousand dollar patronage dividends every year. Right, but this distribution piece didn't make money. The board got rid of it without asking anybody laid off 12 people, 
um, sold the trucks. Uh, and um, what that did is it created an enormous amount of distrust between the, the new CEO who sort of guided the board to make that decision um, and the board and the members. Um, there was an up, you know, like a, um, there was a, you know, an uproar, a real problem with that. This was something that changed the, you know, this is, this, this company had started as a, as a fresh bread bakery company and they had, uh, you know, changed this sort of very nature of this um, without asking anybody's, um, you know, without asking the members uh, input, without sort of figuring out what to do with those folks. Um, and it was a huge problem. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, to, to sort of not think through this stuff, at, you know, is, 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 it can, can be, you, know, you can, can ignore this at your peril. Um, it can be a real problem for folks. Um, so we're really, uh, we're, we're, we're short on time. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to sort of jump through some stuff real quick, just to give a very, very high level of the next pieces. Um, and I apologize for, um, uh, for that. Um, the um, this piece here is this is this decision making matrix, um, and so what we encourage folks to think about is sort of take this document, take a document like this, and break out these different kind of areas of work like governance, planning, um, and you and you build out kind of the specific um, uh, you know things, and it's going to change over time, and you decide it's like for the board, the members, or in, in this case it's the executive director, but it could be the CEO or the president or, or you know, management team, um, who decides, who advises, and who prepares what the thing is. Um, uh, and so in this case, you know, we've got, you know, here it's saying like changing the size composition of the board, right? This is something that, you know, the, this, at this co-op, the members are going to decide that. The board is going to advise around that, and the executive you know, team is going to be Asked to prepare prepare materials around it. Um, now you might say, no, the member, you know, member committee is going to do the, you know, the preparation of that. In which case, the decision and the preparation would both sit in the, you know, within the members. Um, but building out this kind of this matrix can be a really powerful um, guide guidepost for how you're thinking about um, decisions, and it can get very, you know, it can get very specific, um, uh, you know, and quite, you know, and long, right? It can be a, it can be a big um, uh, a big piece. Um, so this is, I think, a really powerful tool um, uh, for um, for folks. Um, the the next the next piece is I'm going to jump over real quick. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to jump to the the democratic management um, section here. Um, and just you know, give a very very high level overview. Um, uh, that I think in, you're really just sort of with some sort of core resources. Um, uh, this is a picture of Corey Rosen. He's the founder of the National Center for Employee Ownership. Um, and and one of the things that Corey is is like to talk about is uh, you know in in people talk about giving people a sense of ownership all the time, right? And he sort of says like a sense of ownership is kind of like a sense of lunch. Um, it's not particularly satisfying. Um, that real ownership is, uh, um, you know, you, you want to give people real meaningful um, uh, ownership by giving them actual ownership. Um, but that the engagement really, you know, um, uh, the engagement around this stuff really does matter. Um, and that participatory and democratic management systems can really help you. Um, so I'm just going to go through some very high level stuff here in terms of some of the resources that we think you know, folks should be looking at. Um, so one is uh, this um, is a, it's a thing called Frontiers and Boundaries. Um, and that's and it's uh, th this is sort of the, 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 the chart that, that um, uh, you work here. And it's sort of similar to the chart we sort of laid out earlier of like you've got these sort of like department work level decisions, you've got managerial decisions, you've got corporate decisions. And the question is, who's making that, you know, who's making these decisions? So it's another way of sort of thinking about that, you know, that framework. Um, but one of the things that they talk about is they talk about um, sort of the rights and responsibilities um, 
and sort of finding the balance between those rights and responsibilities and making sure people understand those rights and responsibilities. Um, so, you know, entrepreneurship is a really good one. So part of ownership is about, you know, there's these different elements of ownership, right? As a co-op member, you, you have these different elements of ownership, um, one of which is entrepreneurship. So the right of entrepreneurship is you get the money, right? Like if you, if you make money, you get it. Um, the responsibility for entrepreneurship is you've got to make sure that like the business is in a position to get money and to make money. Um, we use an example a lot of times of, um, you know, if you're running a retail shop and uh, in the middle of the night, um, you know, there's a, a, you know, like a fire or there's a break in or there's a, um, uh, you know, damage, who's going to show up at 3 a.m., um, you know, to make, to, to check on that, right? That's a responsibility of entrepreneurship, right? Um, you, you are, you've got to, you know, you've got to be there to make sure um, uh, that's that. And the benefit you get for that, the right you get for that is the, um, is the profits. Um, another um, great resource is this facilitator's guide to participatory decision-making. Um, and so this is just a high level piece of it, um, but it's sort of these sort of core values uh, um, and the idea is that like, if you've got participatory decision-making, you get sort of full participation. And, and the idea is that you'll make wise decisions. You'll make the best decisions if you, if you have, you know, if everybody's engaged in the decision-making. Um, uh, so sort of, sort of, you know, group decisions are, you know, you know uh, participatory decisions are wise decisions. Um, and, uh, and so it's this sort of, you know, these sort of core principles there's some really great resources of like how to think about meeting facilitation, um, you know, in this uh, that can really um, drive it. And, and uh, that book is um, strangely available by PDF. You can buy it for thirty dollars, but um, the Democracy Work Institute has a link to get it for free. So I'll send it to you, and you can get it for free. Um, uh, another one is the Great Game of Business. Is anybody familiar with the Great Game of Business? So this is a really common and popular thing in um, uh, the ESOP community. And they, they have these sort of three elements here, but it's really about making sure people are aware of the operations and the finances of the business, right? Um, and so it's got these three elements. No one teach the game rules. The game rules meaning like, um, uh, kind of how the business is is uh, is making money and 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 whether it's making money. Um, you want to make sure that people have a stake in the outcome. So that if you're like increasing sales or you're reducing costs or you're improving productivity, that folks are getting you know paid for that. And you need to have systems to keep you know keep on track of that. Um, and then the last one um, before we end is uh, is Zingerman's. Um, if anybody's ever been to Ann Arbor, Michigan, there's uh, Zingerman's is the uh, the sandwich shop. Um, Zingerman's also has a participatory management training um, uh, program, and it's really great. And um, uh, the founder, he's a self-proclaimed anarchist, and he, you know, he, he puts in this thing, you know, anarchists need structure too. Um, and they have this sort of vision um, uh, piece, and it's these sort of four elements of of what the um, of how you think about vision. How that drives to principles, and then you balance culture and systems around that. Um, and and we really, I really think this sort of you know one of the key things here is is that you get to is you figure out um, uh, um, you know what kind of problems you have, right? Do you have a systems do you have a systems problem? Do you have a training problem, or do you have a management problem? Um, and uh, it's um, it can be a really great um, uh, and valuable approach. Um, and so I've, there's some, some selected chapters from his first book that I'll send as well that I think are really valuable. Um, and then finally, our pieces. Um, we've got some, you know, these sort of these three things, the design and governance systems, framework of democratic control, and developing the creative power of worker owners, three resources we'll share with folks. Um, and uh, and that is, um, that is it uh, for us. Yeah. Um, on this, and we're over a little time, and I apologize for that. Um, yeah. And we didn't get through everything. Um, uh, if folks are 
if folks are open to stay a little bit longer to have some questions, I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah. But I just, uh, I apologize for sort of rushing up against the, the, the clock on that. Yeah. Um, well, well, Dave, thanks. And and we can stay a little longer if folks have some comments. Because I do have a big question to ask. Um, uh, the resources that you've shared were, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, all developed prior to the pandemic. That's true. And so given what we now have been experiencing uh, since the pandemic, what models now are we're finding being more useful today based on those experiences that we've gone through with this pandemic. And then the other question is bringing in culture into this conversation around governance. And how does culture begin to influence governance going forward? Um, again, looking hindsight, at the pandemic and, and what the cultural uh, uh, drivers have been now invoking new conversations in terms of how we do what we do. I'm trying to figure out how to end the presentation here so I can come back to the, I apologize for this. Um, while you're doing that, Dave, I don't think there's necessarily been a, enough time for a lot to be done um, or even assessed in that area, Ron. But what I will say, there's a couple of projects in New York City. I, I mentioned at the beginning, I think I did, that um, New York City started this hotline, which it calls Owners to Owners, which was an extension of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative. And that hotline was specifically developed as part of the answer to uh, recovering from the COVID epidemic and making it easier for traditional business owners to look at this alternative and explain it to them. Because there's also uh, presentations and meetings and, and things that also go along with, with that project. Um, for using that as a way of coming back from how COVID has impacted things. And there's a separate initiative that they have um, that that actually grew out of where they're developing um, what they call kind of a guidebook. It's, it's not yet developed, but a guidebook for small businesses, um, for resources and, and methods and things for them to do to come back from, you know, for the recovery from COVID, which probably once they get that done, a lot of other cities around the country mm. probably use something like that. But Dave, specifically as to um, employee ownership? Yeah, I mean, I think so. So there's a group called the Praxis Consulting Group um, that has done a series of webinars. Um, they primarily focus on ESOPs. Um, one of the sort of um, issues or it's not necessarily a problem, but it's it's just sometimes it's not necessarily perfectly applicable um, to uh, um, to worker co-ops or to other kinds of co-ops. But there's a lot more people in the ESOP space because there's a lot more ESOPs. Um, and so uh, but there's a few folks in that in that space who are really, you know, who really get democracy and participation um, and who really believe in that. And one of those folks is through Praxis. They put together a bunch, a series of webinars around how you, you know, in specific response to how companies, you know, can be, um, you know, responding to, um, you know, to the pandemic and how they should think about, you know, you know, employee um, uh, uh, participation and governance issues in that space. Uh, it is a, you know, the thing I would say on that is um, for, it's the principles of, transparency and engagement if you have the if you if you bring those principles through um then you know the the pandemic just sort of changed how you might execute on those but it's really about making sure that those principles you know you know continue continue through there um 
And, you know, if you think about kind of like businesses, you know, having to shut down or to do layoffs, if folks are engaged, if folks are educated, if, you know, if, if revenue is down or problems are going to be happening, happening, like that's a reality. If people are understanding why that's happening and they understand the reason of it, right, and they have trust around it, then it's far, people are far more open to accepting that answer as being real, right? Like it's, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a reason people are like, don't trust the boss. The boss is always lying, right? Um, and if the, if you're, but if you're building out a system of, uh, you know, where there's real meaningful transparency and accountability to that stuff, then you, um, then that information can be more, um, uh, you know, can be believed more. Um, and, and, and that, that addresses that cult, that sort of rolls right into that culture question. Um, the, you know, the, the culture, we, we, we talk about this really in the sense of like, you have to be really intentional about the culture you create, because if you don't, you're going to wind up with the culture that we kind of live in, which is one that is not necessarily built around trust and cooperation um, uh, that gets to sort of binary thinking and, 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 uh, and is, you know, is a real, you know, can be a real challenge. Um, and so if, uh, yeah, so that, that, the culture piece is um, is incredibly important. I mean, I'll just say from ICA, you know, at our at our level of who we are, we've grown a lot, and 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 it's ha had some real growing pains on the culture, right? Things that we used to do that felt great feel feel problematic now, and you know, and it's some, you know, like so it's you know, culture matters. It's it is the one of the most critical pieces, um, and uh, and so it's. You know, spending time thinking through that, being intentional about it, I think is is one of the most powerful and important things anybody can do with their in terms of their creating their co-op. And and I think we we don't put enough time into that. Um, finding the balance between business and culture is really important. But there, it's that Zingerman's that Zingerman's piece I put out. It has this sort of culture and systems on two sides, right? That balance is really important. Like. It's got to be a 50-50. You need to make money, right? You don't exist if you don't cover your costs. But if you if you if you make money at the expense of you know building like who you want to be, um, you know that balance is really 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 critical. Um, yeah, and that, and that struck me that struck me as well because I, I kind of saw principles as being kind of the glue between the two. That kind of is always in the background, front and center, in terms of how you move the work forward on both sides of culture and systems so so that i mean that, that that makes a lot of sense all right well i know we've gone over a little um and dave and excuse me and shelly I, I really uh, appreciate and and uh you coming in this morning and sharing all your knowledge with with the group um um it was a big ass and i'm i'm just happy that they, that you were able to respond um um, to to the ask, uh, Shelly, Dave shared with me that you're in Atlanta and uh, with your with, with your family and and oh, thank yeah. you for, for stepping aside and, and giving us some of the, your family time today. Sure, so appreciate that. Appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. You're very uh, well. Yeah, well, we, we know we, we're getting a relationship. Looking forward to to working with ICA as we continue to move forward the work that we're doing here at the network. Um, Going to rely on you and look for you, Shelly and Dave, for for your leadership and 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 the intentionality that you bring into the space and supporting the work that we're doing and working with in underserved uh, communities ar ar around the country and working with the organizations who are intentional about building this framework around cooperatives, uh, uh, cooperatively owned businesses. Um, if there any more questions uh, anyone has of of Dave and and and, and Shelly uh, before we allow them just to go off and have their their Saturday day students rest of the Saturday to themselves. Well great. Well great. Again, well again David and, and, and Shelly, thank you both for your time uh this morning. It's well appreciated. Um we humbly thank you. Um because I know what the, the yeah. big is on, on on giving Saturday time to anything during this time right now. Um we're gonna wrap up and uh and and Shelly and Dave, you can go ahead and sign off and and Dave Thank we'll, you. We'll make, Thank you. Thank we'll, you. We'll Bye everybody. Enjoy everybody. Um